Welcome to today's Fridays with Vistage webinar with Simon Sinek. I'm Dave Nelson, a nine-year Vistage member and frequent speaker on the topic of social media and your Fridays with Vistage host. Just a few quick items to go over today. To submit questions at any time during the presentation, type your question into the Ask a Question text area that's below the video screen, and we'll uh, feed it into the presentation. Also, if you need support, check your confirmation email. Now, let's get started. Simon Sinek tra travels the world teaching leaders and organizations how to inspire people with a bold goal of helping build a world in which the vast majority of people go home every day feeling fulfilled by their work, and that is a bold goal indeed, Sinek is leading a movement to inspire people to do things that inspire them. Sinek is the author of Start With Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action, and he'll be speaking about Start With Why at our upcoming Vistage Think Big Chair Member International Conference in Dallas in January. Today, Simon will answer questions about leadership and innovation. Great to have you with us, Simon. Let's start off with the first question. What is your best practice for stimulating innovative thinking? Um, well, I mean, before anybody uh, can innovate anything, we have to understand sort of where innovation comes from. Um, one of the biggest mistakes organizations make when they try to drive innovation is they try, they, they literally give that instruction, help be more innovative, come up with something more innovative. I mean, I don't even know how you begin to do that, you know? Um, and the problem is, is, is most people uh, look at their product or look at their industry and they attempt to innovate around a product. And so, you know, come up with a, a better television. What do you do? You make it bigger, you make it thinner, you make the definition a little higher. You know, this, th these are, this is not innovation. This is product improvement. It's adding features, it's important stuff, but it's not innovation. Innovation is coming up with ideas that advance towards a higher goal. So, you know, I, I talk about why we do what we do, um, the reason our companies exist, um, and it's this that drives innovation. The, the story that I love to tell is, you know, is way back before Apple even existed, uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were in a, in a garage in Cupertino, California, and they came up with something called the Little Blue Box, which allowed people to avoid playing, paying long distance rates on their phone bills. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, even back then, even before Apple, they were challenging the status quo. They were challenging sort of the existing incumbent large monopolies. And by creating this little blue box, they allowed people to challenge, you know, AT&T, you know, Ma Bell. And then they uh, founded Apple and they challenged Big Blue, IBM, the existing status quo monopoly computer platform. Then they challenged Microsoft. Then they challenged uh, the music industry. Then they challenged the phone industry. Then, you know, then publishing. And if you're in television and movies, you're next. It's a repeating pattern. What's so important is Jobs didn't come to work and tell people come up with a better computer. He came to work and told people find ways to challenge uh, existing status quo monopolies and give individuals the, uh, a simpler alternative. And it's other people inside the organizations who came up with all the ideas. Jobs actually came up with none of the ideas that made Apple famous. Other people within the organization did. Um, and what you'll find is that within great organizations, the guys at the top never come up with the big ideas. They usually only ever had one big idea. It was the idea they formed the company around. And it's, it's their ability to articulate why they came up with that, that, that idea in the first place that inspires others to, to, to advance and, and innovate. Okay, so what questions should we ask to encourage innovation? Uh, again, you know, an environment for innovation um, is, is giving people um, um, a noble cause to pursue. Um, if you think about what we do when we set out in the world, imagine that we're standing in a big empty room, right? We're standing in a big empty room and I give you a very simple instruction. I want, to go, I want you to go to the far left corner in a straight line. Uh, so what do you do? You head off you know, to the far left corner and without telling you I put a chair in front of you. What do you do? You go around the chair. This is the wonderful thing about human beings, which is when we're given a sense of destination, we figure out a way around the chair, right? When we know where we're going. Um, this is just the wonderful thing about human beings, which is when we are clear on the destination, the route is flexible. Um, let's reset. Let's just start the example again. We're standing in the same uh, corner of an empty room, and I give you a simple instruction. Uh, um, uh, go in a straight line to some point in this room. And off you go. You know, you pick a random point, and without telling you, I put a chair in front of you, except this time you come to a grinding halt or make a sudden sharp turn. And when I say, what are you doing? You say, well, how can I go in a straight line if you 
you put a chair in front of me. The point is, is when we are obsessive about the strategy, um, every, obstacle, every obstacle becomes insurmountable. When we are clear about the destination, um, then we figure out ways to go around the obstacles. And this is what innovation is. It's our ability to think through a problem to get to a specific destination in which we're clear. The problem is, is that most companies, when they articulate destinations, they're not truly destinations. They're simply random points um, in the room. You know, we pick a goal at, uh, you know, this year we want to increase top line revenues by $10 million. Why not $15 million? Why not $5 million? You know, they're completely arbitrary random points in the room, and then we obsess about strategy to get to that point. The problem is we're literally inhibiting um, uh, innovation because we're not giving, um, we're not, there's not a specific uh, a point that we're trying to reach every single year. Great organizations, it doesn't matter which year they're in business, they're always driving to get to that, that same corner of the room, you know, to give people a simple alternative, you know, to, 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 um, to, to give people, the, to inspire people to get out there and just do it. I mean, whatever it is, um, um, in my case, inspire people to do what inspires them. Um, year after year after year after year, I set out to do the same thing, and the goals that I set are simply waypoints to help me measure that I'm making progress. The problem is we confuse the goals with the destination. We confuse the random points uh, uh, for, for destination. So I always level set to the very, very, very far idealized future. I mean, look how America works. You know, Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, I mean, it's a declaration of why the country exists, that all men are created equal. and what our country has continued to do, sometimes we're better at it than others, is we're always in pursuit of this ideal destination and every obstacle that comes our way, we try and find a way over or around this obstacle to get to that idealized destination way, way off in, 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 the, in, the, in the infinite future. Um, we don't say, you know, this year we're gonna increase GDP by, you know, X percent. I mean, we, we, we do those things, but that, that, that's not what drives innovation. What role does the marketplace play in innovation? In other words, ideas are great, but how do we vet whether the market will buy our ideas? The question is, how do you vet if the market will buy ideas? Um, simply, if they buy them. Um, you know, th this is the concept behind authenticity. It's tiring and boring listening to people tell us you have to be authentic. You know, people prefer to vote for the authentic candidate. They prefer to buy from the authentic brand. You know, how do you implement authenticity? Um, uh, I get a kick out of, you know, sort of the marketing industry, um, you know, which to quote unquote help companies be more authentic. We're going to do con conduct market research. We're going to go into the market and ask people, you know, what they want from you. That's like asking your friends, you know, how do you want me to speak to you? How do you want me to dress so that you'll like me more? You know, and your friends are going to be like, what? You'd be like, I value your friendship and I want to speak to you and dress in a way that, that will ensure that, you know, this friendship lasts. And your friends are going to be like, oh, God, just be yourself. You know, it's the same in business. You know, which is we, we, we play this silly game where we go out and ask people what we should be in an attempt to be authentic. The reality is they want us to, uh, to be who we are. And so if we know who we are, if we're producing products and services uh, uh, that are symbolic and emblematic of what we believe and the cause we're trying to advance, then those who believe what we believe will buy and those who don't believe what we believe won't buy. Um, we're much more interested in the loyalty we can produce than we are just in the simple transaction. Um, you know, there's a huge difference between repeat business and loyalty. Repeat business means I do business with you over and over and over again. Loyalty means I'm willing to turn down a better product at a better price to continue to do business with you. And it's the loyalty that matters most. Um, and so the way to vet it is to see if, if people respond to it. You know, market research is good tactically, but not, not at the higher level. How does your limbic brain, I think they call it, your subconscious work, and how can it help you solve business problems? Uh, the question is, how does your subconscious factor into driving innovation? Um, your conscious brain, your, the, the part of your brain involved in sort of when you, when you access your expertise, this is the part of the brain we're accessing uh, when we have our brainstorming sessions. Um, the part of your brain that you access when you, you know, make your list of pros and cons, that part of your brain, the conscious part of your brain, the thinking part of your brain, has access to the equivalent of about two feet of information around you. Your subconscious brain, um, uh, has access to the equivalent of 11 acres of information. In other words, every lesson you've learned, every relationship you've had, every you know, story you've heard gets filed away somewhere. And your brain has the ability to access that information even though it's not quote unquote thinking, because thinking is, is conscious and, and, and rational. And this is why we have ideas in the shower or in, you know, when we go for a run or in the morning commute, um, is because our subconscious brain is continuing to uh, 
to e evaluate that problem, and sometimes it gives us answers, you know, and just shows up seemingly out of nowhere. The challenge for the subconscious brain is that it can't think about problems that haven't been posed. It can't answer questions that haven't been asked. And so the value of the brainstorming session is to pose the question, to raise the problem, and vet all of the quote-unquote, you know, thinking answers, and then just let people go away. You know, don't expect to have a brainstorming session and come up with the answer. It just does not happen. And you just let people go away and do their thing. You don't ask anybody to come in with anything. You know, go and give it a think at home. No, no, no. Go and don't think about anything. And the simple posing of the question, the, the mind continues to, to ruminate. And what you find is people come into work, they go, I got it. I had it on the way to work. And, and then you can discuss it and figure out the details. Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is why you ever have that feeling when you leave the house that you've forgotten something but you don't know what it is. And halfway to work, you're like, damn, I forgot my sunglasses. You know, it's like your subconscious brain, your feeling part of your brain, is fully aware of what's going on in the world. It just doesn't have language. So the best that it can offer is the feeling that you've forgotten something. And only later on does it whack you in the head. It's the same with ideas. So real innovative thinking does not happen in brainstorming sessions. It happens uh, when we least expect it. But brainstorming sessions are valuable for posing the questions or uh, uh, proposing the problems. Okay. How do you recommend that we increase creativity in our companies so that our employees explore, say, a greater range of possibilities. And how do creativity and curiosity relate to each other? Well, I mean, the more you fill, the more you can fill in your brain, the more you have access to solve problems. Um, I'm a great believer that when we do things to help our employees, you know, instead of giving them training about the job they do, we should give them experiences that have nothing to do with the job they do, at least not seemingly connected. Um, because the way uh, people solve problems in other industries and the way people uh, um, you know, take advantage of opportunities in other places are relevant all over the place, not just in those, not just in those places. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, the more curiosity you have, you find the real great idea people are the ones that have curiosity outside of their own. People that are obsessed about becoming experts in their own field are not the most creative usually. They're just experts, well, whatever that does. Um, but uh, no, creativity and, uh, uh, and curiosity are, are, are very much interlinked. I mean, for example, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, I remember um, when I first discovered my why, you know, the first thing I did was I canceled all the subscriptions to all my own industry trades. And the reason is I realized that all I was reading were things that other people have already done, which means I feel bad that I didn't do them or come up with them, or all I could do was respond and become Johnny Come Lately. And what I started doing was reading about other people in other industries. <laughs> I got ideas from them that hadn't already come up with or been applied in the industry that I was working in. And, uh, and it's amazing how much I've learned about one industry from looking at a place that has nothing to do with it. You know, I've learned more about business from spending time with the military, and I've learned more about the military from spending time with business. Yeah, once you think about it, that really makes sense. Another question from the audience. I understand the importance of culture in supporting innovation. But is the physical environment of the workplace as important as the culture in fostering innovation? How does it factor in? I mean, you know, we're, we're social animals. And, uh, and we are accountable to each other more than we are accountable to ourselves. And, um, and we enjoy working together. And we work well together when we find people who believe what we believe and over the course of time develop trusted relationships. And so you want to create an environment in which ideas can spread and, and, and one that fosters communication. Um, uh, the fact that we solve problems by sending people emails as opposed to getting up from our desks and talking to somebody is, is, is a stifle on, on innovation. Um, the fact that we allow people to uh, engage via BlackBerry uh, versus uh, picking up the telephone uh, stifles innovation. Um, the more people can interact, the more innovation you'll have. But there's a limitation as well. There's something called Dunbar's number, which uh, Professor Dunbar from University is from, he theorized that we cannot maintain um, any more than about 150 relationships. And people believe that when we went online, that that number would be rendered useless. And it turns out that even online, we can still only maintain about 150 close relationships. And the reason is actually very, very simple. Um, it's because there's two limiting factors. One is time. You know, you cannot get to know everybody really well and earn trust from everybody if you can only give everybody two minutes. Um, and so time is a limiting factor. And the other one is uh, brain capacity. We can't remember everybody. Um, some people can remember more and some people can remember less, which is why we say it's about 150. And what we see is in organizations um, um, that are fewer than 150 people, 
the level of productivity uh, and innovation is much, much higher than organizations that start to get larger. And so I know some large tech companies that when they were uh, in a big open you know, space with about 150 people, the communication, the inspiration, the, 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 the interaction, the, the collaboration was very high. And they believed that it was their open space plan that, that allowed for that. And so as they grew, they kept the open space plan. The problem was communication went down as the numbers got big because people now didn't know everybody. They didn't want to offend anybody by asking them to turn down their music. They didn't tell anybody to shut up. They didn't spew, you know, throw out ideas. Um, um, and there's some great examples of this. Um, you know, the company uh, Gore-Tex, um, they realized that as their factory started to grow uh, bigger, uh, they started to see problems in productivity and communication. And so they didn't know about Dunbar's number, but um, what they would do is when a, when a factory would get to about 150 people, they would open an entirely new factory to do the exact same thing. On paper, this was the stupidest thing in the world because there was massive amounts of redundancy and they weren't using their machines to maximum capacity. But the result was such, uh, such an increase in productivity and communication amongst the people um, that it, 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 the, it, 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 it um, significantly um, uh, was significantly more valuable than whatever waste they had in, in lots of, uh, of uh, you know, sort of machine time. Um, so, so you want to keep an open space, you want to allow people to interact, um, but you want to be mindful of, of, the, of the numbers as well. Smaller is better. And by the way, the ideal number for a team is three. <laughs> My friend, my friend Charlie Kim over at Next Jump, which is a remarkably innovative company, they did lots of experimentation to, uh, to figure out what's the ideal number of people to solve problems, and they tried everything from teams of two to ten, and they found out uh, that three, three is the best number. I can hear people talking about the bridge. What's going on? Interesting, and indeed a bit counterintuitive. Can you share additional examples of companies that are great at sustained innovation? Who would you cite? You know, don't, let's not confuse what innovation means. You know, innovation doesn't mean necessarily uh, technology. Innovation is the application of technology or, uh, or engineering to, uh, to solve a problem. And there must be a problem to solve. I and mean, I'll give you a brilliant example of great innovation. Um, and I'll give you a, a, a terrible example of innovation. You know, we, we believe that adding a motor to everything or making it any, everything digital is innovative. It's not. It's, there's no problems we're solving. You know, when we decided to make, you know, uh, what they call them, uh, you know, when you, when you want to show a slide presentation, you bring the, the, the screen into the room, you know, uh, the projection screen. Um, you know, who was it who decided that we had to start making all of them, uh, we, had to put motor, we had to motorize them all? Um, in the history of time, I can never remember anything being wrong with pulling a string from the ceiling and having the thing come out. But I cannot tell you how often that motorized screen is always broken. In other words, just because we can doesn't mean we should. We weren't solving a problem. We weren't solving a problem. Com conversely, if you go to uh, Bed Bath and Beyond and you go to the toaster section, walk through all the toasters and uh, for the buttons, you know, to push the button down to toast to make the toast, push up on the button. Not all of them have that feature. That's innovation. In other words, you don't have to dig a fork into your toaster to get the piece of toast that got stuck in there. You simply push up. And that was the application of engineering to solve a real human problem. And so if you look at all great innovation in the world, um, they're always solving a unique problem. You know, Apple fundamentally, Steve Jobs fundamentally believed that we should not have to adapt our lives to fit the technology. Technology should be adapted to fit our lives. And so his obsession with usability and simplicity you know, when the phone came out, when the iPhone came out, it had one button on it. Because why should we have to learn all the buttons and features? We should make it simple that everything's intuitive. It was his obsession. And if you look at everything Apple does, it's about integrating the technology seamless into our lives, not forcing us to change or learn the technology. Um, you know, you see it in customer service companies as well. You know, Southwest Airlines, or uh, um, back in the days of uh, Continental when Gordon Bethune empowered his employees, you know, um, the innovation there is, is that they give the employees the opportunity to solve problems and there's no manual that they have to defer to with, with rules. Innovation is going, again, it's, it's, it's going beyond the rules and, and the set constraints to solve the human problem. Um, um, and, uh, and, and people, when you empower people to solve problems, you get very innovative solutions. One of our participants is asking, what is the difference between creativity and innovation? Can you compare and contrast? Uh, somebody asked the difference between creativity and innovation. Well, creativity is a process, right? And innovation is an outcome. Um, 
um, I, I think they're, they go together. Uh, I, I think there must be an element of creativity to, to have innovation. Um, um, you know, creativity is, is, and I think people forget this, creativity is born out of chaos. <laughs> There's nothing orderly about creativity. You know, um, creative minds, you know, have messy desks and messy hair and, you know, there's a lot of paint all over the wall and, you know, creativity is, 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 is the willingness to step into chaos to find order or ideas. Um, uh, and and, and from, from that creative process, from that chaos, from that, you know, and, and by the way, creativity is not efficient. Anybody who, who attempts to put strict budgets or strict constraints on creativity what you're doing is constraining because creativity. I mean, creativity is inefficient, and creativity is, is wasteful very often, because creativity requires experimentation and iteration, and sometimes you have to go through the process six times, or sometimes you don't understand it, but you know something's there, so you try again. Um, this is creativity. It, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is wasteful. Um, however, the result is, 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 worth, is worth its weight in gold, if you allow it to happen. Um, and uh, uh, and the result the result of these of, of the ideas found and the application of those ideas it's the application of the ideas that that, that is born uh, that that bears uh, innovation uh, you know what what did Thomas Edison say Thomas Edison say you know vision without execution is hallucination um, creativity becomes innovation when we execute got it we've got a chat question here to what extent should innovation be applied to the longer term or you might call them timeless elements of your business, uh, things like core values, vision. Should innovation be applied to the timeless uh, elements of your business, like uh, values or vision? Um, you know, your vision should remain fixed and never change for the, the life of your company. Um, and, and if your vision is to be the preeminent supplier or the rate, rated number one or, you know, whatever, you know, those aren't visions. You know, those are just big goals that most of your company doesn't really care about. A vision is just that, it's a vision. I have a dream, you know, it's a vision of the world far off in the future um, uh, uh, that, that you hope to help build with your company and your product. And you use your company and your product as a vessel, as a vehicle to get to that place. That's a real vision. Um, so that should not be changed. And the values shouldn't be changed either. However, the application of those values and the manner in which you pursue that vision, um, that is where innovation lives. Innovation is about is about implementation, right? It's about execution. Um, you shouldn't you shouldn't be applying the latest hullabaloo, you know, uh, trend to your to your values because you know then they're not fixed and then nobody knows what you stand for and that's even more dangerous. So no no no, in innovation comes in the application. You know how how do we bring our values to life? That's innovative. How what are the means in which we we, we, we aim to pursue our vision? You know what what are the what's the route we're going to take to get that 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 far right corner of the, of the, of the room, that's innovation. Well, you know, how are we going to overcome this obstacle so that we can s stay in the right direction? That's innovation. Um, in innovation is, uh, is in pursuit of something. It's not, it's not gratuitous. Um, like I said, just because we can doesn't mean we should. I think a lot of people are very uh, hypnotized by the fact that we can make everything whiz-bang, digital, you know, shiny, uh, but, but to what end? Um, there's, there's no value to these things whatsoever. Okay, when does innovative thought, let's take that again, take two. When does innovative thought cross the line and become too much? In other words, many companies are constantly trying to change their stripes instead of holding the course for the long haul, right? Success takes time. Innovation may be imperative, but isn't also balance and weathering the storm for the long term? What are your thoughts? I think what we do is we attempt to uh, iterate, uh, you know, version 10 before we started with version 1. You know, when you have a vision of what could be or a technology that could exist or an, a way to improve something or other, um, you know, we, we, try to build, we try to build it in its complete form. You know, we do this with websites all the time. You know, what is the perfect website? And now go build that. And, um, and we sort of produce some kind of broken version at the end and then we spend all of our time trying to fix it. The reality is uh, real innovation is iterative. And even though you may have a vision of the place you'd like to get to, the question is what's version one? You know, what, is the, what, is the, what are the, the simplest few steps that you could take that wouldn't be perfect and they wouldn't be what you imagined, but they'd be one step towards that and it would work. It wouldn't be ideal, but it would work. Do that. 
okay, now, what's the one thing you could do or the couple things you could do to improve upon version one to make it even closer to the thing you imagined? Okay, now do that. Okay, now what's the one or two things that you could, and if you do this iterative component where you're okay starting with something small, what ends up happening is you build, 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 and by the time you get to 10, you actually have a vision of 20 now. So you can go way beyond versus the first example where all you're doing is trying to fix it so that 10 actually works. Um, so the innovative organizations, although they may have a vision of the far off thing, they don't start with the far off thing. They actually start with something much smaller. So big things always start small, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a much, much, much more efficient way um, to drive innovation when you don't start with the big thing, you start with the small thing. Got it. So start small. So what do you do when you run into resistance to change from the marketplace? Don't customers resist change? You know, the, the, you know, the funny thing about people who are resistant to change is, is there is a point at which they embrace something that was different to what they have now, and then they, because what they have now they got good at or they got used to, now they don't want it to alter. And, and so, once again, what we do, the mistake we make when we want to implement change is we say, okay, here's version A, which you're currently using, using, and what we want to propose to you is version X, because it's so much better and it fixes this and it fixes that and it fixes this, and, and it's, it's scary because it's so, so different. And it goes, you know, it goes back to my previous answer. Small change, nobody, nobody has any problems with small change. You know, it, you know if, if you tell me that, you know, uh, you know, you're, you're going to completely change the way I, you know, I watch television, where you're going to take away the screen and now and I'm going to be hung by the ceiling from wires and I have to interact with the television and I'll feel everything that goes on. I'd be like, you know what, I'm fine sitting on my couch. But if you tell me that, you know, you, you, know, you can add one tiny little feature of smell, you know, oh, I'll have that. And you say, okay, we're going to add one other tiny feature, which is 3D. Oh, I'll try that one too. And then you have another tiny feature. We're going to just attach one wrist to the ceiling and then you'll be able to tug and feel what the characters on the screen feel like. Ooh, 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 I like that. Okay, you tried it with one wrist. What about two wrists? Okay, I'll try two wrists. And before you know it, you, you're strung from the ceiling enjoying television. You know? Um, we, we're perfectly, perfectly comfortable with small change. And, and, and when it's presented to us as solving one small problem, we, we embrace it very quickly. The problem is, is that we try and force massive change on people. Um, and so, once again, little, little pieces in total equals one big piece. And before they know it, They've, they've, they've changed direction completely and, um, and, uh, and they didn't even realize they got there. Now, you know, you have disruptive change. Um, that's the stuff of revolution, right? That's disruptive change. And they are very, very rare and, and they, have, they um, meet lots and lots of resistance. And even with them, there's still time for it to settle. You know, um, even in a revolution, I mean, you know, everybody's not fully bought in right after the revolution, but we, 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 we've broken everything now, you know? And, and, uh, and so usually um, these kinds of revolutionary disruptive changes um, happen with the invention of truly new uh, technologies. Um, but again, it's not like it happens overnight. Um, you know, even the internet, you know, it hobbled around for a little bit before it reached the tipping point. Um, but like I said, the, to pursue disruptive innovation, that, you know, I don't know anybody who successfully pursued disruptive innovation. Usually it's an accident. Um, 99 times out of 100 is an excellent. Another chat question. Do our patent laws help or hinder innovation? I mean, <laughs> I mean, patent laws don't do anything. It's the manner in which we apply them. Like, it's the people. You know, I, you know, I believe ideas are for sharing, and everybody gets very, very possessive of their ideas. A good friend of mine a long time ago wanted to share an idea with me. And, you know, we go into a conference room and he closes the door and I said to him, do you want me to sign an NDA? And he says to me, I'm going to teach you something about ideas, Simon. He says, um, no, you don't have to sign an NDA. And the reason is, is because uh, people who are protective, so, or, or who are so aggressively protective of their ideas only have one idea. Um, you know, if you're an idea person, you're going to have hundreds of ideas, some of which will get stolen, some of which will get implemented, and some of which will, you know, most of which will sit in a notebook somewhere and never see the light of day. Um, for my taste, you know, I implement the ideas that I'm capable of implementing, and those that I know that I'm not capable of implementing, I give them away, because I'd rather see them implemented. Um, my value is that the people who steal them or are given them, they know they didn't come up with it. They may like to tell people they did, but they know they didn't, so I mean, what do I care? Um, but, um, 
you know, ideas are for sharing. It's the, it's the application of ideas. And if you look at the pharmaceutical industry, um, there's a great example of where uh, uh, patent law really, they use it against themselves. So, you know, you develop a new drug, you have a patent that gives you exclusivity on it for 17 years, and they milk the heck out of it for 17 years, and they rape the customer and charge, you know, $50 a pill because they're the only one who can do it. And then as it gets closer and closer and closer to the end of their patent, then they start panicking because they know that generics will soon be available. And, you know, and the problem is, is that these things have 17-year uh, uh, shelf life and before, you know, nothing happens. And it's this ridiculous cycle of, of screw everybody and then panic. Um, if they took a more open-minded approach where they licensed, that, licensed out the, the, the technology or the, or the thing and they charged, you know, they brought the, 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 the price down across the board, you know, they now have value to the rest of the world and they're seen as, as, as honest brokers and sharers, but they don't. Um, and, 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 and this is usually what happens. We, we, use, we use patent law as a, not as a means of protecting ourselves, but as a means of competitive advantage. I'm not sure I always agree with that. Related topic, what do you think of the Samsung versus Apple lawsuits? There's a whole spate of these patent lawsuits going on all over the world. I, I find it uninteresting. Um, um, you know, one of the things that I think... Um, you know, the Android platform or even the Samsung phones have completely neglected is that they don't stand for anything. They simply make products, even if they're good products. Um, Apple stands for something. But, and the reason that Android may be outselling Apple isn't because the Samsung product is better or the Android platform is preferred. You have to think about what Apple stands for, right? Apple stands for power to the rebel, right? It's, it's, that's why creatives and young people are drawn to Apple because it's standing up to the status quo. And so the day that, you know, a 14-year-old is sitting in, you know, her bedroom and her dad walks into her, uh, her room and says, hey, honey, I just got an iPhone like you. Can you show me how to use it? i got to get something new. I'm not rebelling against my parents if I have the same phone as my dad. Don't forget, these things are symbols, you know? And when dad gets an iPhone, i got to get something different. And so a large part of what, um, you know, the, the success that some of these other platform phones may be uh, enjoying is not because they're better than Apple. It's because Apple's been so successful at, at that, and it stands for something so clear that it actually runs out, you know, when it becomes uh, a majority thing, uh, which is very interesting. So I, I find the whole battle uh, uninteresting, um, and the fact that Apple and Android, I mean, uh, Samsung and Android have made Apple their target, um, who cares? I mean, go in, you know, the, the weak companies uh, target, uh, you know, one competitor. Strong companies look far, far off in the future and look to advance that cause, um, not to mention the fact that all of these companies are eventually brought down by the competitor they didn't see you know, the small little upstart that came up with a technology that makes them all look like dirt. So, you know, what's the point of focusing on one competitor that you can see because the one that's going to take you down is the one you didn't know existed. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a pointless short-term strategy. So they'll have a little short-term bump. You know, they'll, they'll have some success in the short term. It's, and, you know, they'll, they'll iterate by trying to outdo each other. One comes up with a 15-inch screen, the other comes with a 16-inch screen. One comes up with, you know, 5 gigabytes of, of, of memory, the other one comes with 6 gigabytes of memory. It's just, a, it's, just, it's just a game that fits and starts and keeping up with the Joneses, and it's a race to zero. So another chat question. How do you innovate when your organization is stuck with outdated tools? You know, if people are asking these questions, you know, if you can try, me, try and give me some specifics, it would really help. But, um, uh, but how do you innovate, you know, when the tools are outdated? I mean, I wouldn't even know how to answer that. Come up with new tools? Uh, I mean, I, again, without a specific example, it's, it's hard for me to atta uh, latch on to um, um, what you mean. Um, if you can give me an example of what tools are outdated, you know, I mean, if you're trying, you know, we, we, we managed to get to the moon with, with a computer as powerful as a Commodore 64. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know what's, what's outdated, you know, I don't know. Um, and I think part of innovation is, is not just, I, you know what, actually I can't answer that. I think we're, we're foolish to believe that, that money or technology is the limiting factor. In other words, we would be able to innovate if only we had more powerful X, if only we had more money. The reality is almost everything that ever happened in the world and almost anything great that was ever achieved happened when, when resources were restricted, you know. Uh, um, and it's, that is, it is, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, we, we came up with brilliant ideas because there was, there was no freedom. And I think, you know, corporations, large corporations have bundles of cash. Tell me the last great innovation that a large corporation came up with. They don't come up with any. 
It's small businesses that come up with great organizations. It's small businesses that have no money, are restricted in time, restricted in resources, restricted in employees, don't have competitive advantages. They're the ones that come up with all the big ideas. And it's the big companies uh, who just buy little companies. They don't come up with big ideas. They just buy little companies. That's what they do. You know? Um, uh, so, so I think don't be tricked into believing that, that greater technology or more resources is, is the solution to innovation because all the evidence would prove the exact opposite. Great answer. Uh, a related question, being first to market with an innovative idea can fail if early adopters do not represent a large enough market segment, enough demand to sustain an ongoing company. For this reason, is it better to rapidly imitate rather than to truly innovate, essentially being a fast follower? First to market or fast follower, uh, again, you know, First, there is no such thing as first movers advantage. There's plenty of people that have had a first movers advantage that, that failed. Uh, I kind of like fast follower only because let somebody else make all the early mistakes, um, and there are always early mistakes. You know, uh, Apple did not invent the graphic user interface. Uh, uh, Xerox did. Apple did not invent the personal computer. Um, Apple did not invent, uh, you know, uh, the, I, the iPod, the multi-gigabyte MP3 player. Um, in every single respect, uh, almost to a T, they adapted existing technologies and improved upon them. Um, you know, again, you know, it's, um, there's a huge amount of gambling that goes on to be a first innovator, because if you get it right, congratulations, but if you get it wrong, it doesn't work. Um, there's a, here's an interesting statistic for you, which I really, really, really like. You know, for every, every small business, every startup, that the only reason they're getting into business is to make money. Pick the wrong line. You pick the wrong. You pick the wrong job. You know, if you go to Vegas and you play roulette, your chance of winning is a one one out of thirty eight. Right? There's thirty eight numbers on the wheel. You have a one out of thirty eight chance of hitting jackpot. Right? Of, of hitting your number. Um, there's about a million tech companies, startups that start up every year, and the numbers that actually have a liquidity event. I don't. I don't know the exact number, but a friend of mine figured out the number, the exact number of tech startups that start up every year, and the number that actually sell, have a liquidity event, or go public in a manner in which that makes money for the founders, and it's a 2,000 to 1 uh, uh, odds that you'll actually make money with, with, a, with a startup, 2,000 to 1. And so if you're raising $100,000 of, of seed money, um, you know, so that you can make a ton of money in, with your startup, um, you actually, the odds are vastly, vastly better to take $100,000 and put it on one number at, in Vegas. So this is why you don't start a business to make money, because the odds are actually so far against you. You're better off gambling. And so the reason to start a business is to advance an idea. The reason to start a business is to use that business to scale, you know, something that you that you imagine, you know, um, and and the money comes later. You know, John uh, John Wooden, the winning most coach, the winning the most football coach ever, right, did not care about winning games. He cared about helping players become better human beings, right. And by the way, he failed for seven years before he got it right. Um, but he used football as a vehicle to advance an idea. Use your business as a vehicle to advance an idea, and the money comes. But if you get in business to make money, shit, man, go gamble. It's a lot better odds. Unbelievable odds. Okay, I'm heading to Vegas as soon as this webinar is over. Uh, there's a chat here pointing out, by the way, that Woody Hayes was the football coach. John Wooden coached basketball very successfully, as I recall. So, um, Got that. We sit corrected. Uh, so what do you think makes Apple so different, so much better from an innovation standpoint? I mean, you know, Apple, Apple does not have any particular advantages in the market. You know, they have smart people and they have dumb people. You know, they have, they have great systems and they have inefficient systems. And they have big ideas and they have small ideas and they have bureaucracy and they have ego and they have politics and they have absolutely every problem that we have, right? Um, um, not to mention the fact that every one of their competitors has an equal and open access to all the same resources, media, you know, consultants, agencies. You can hire, you can go hire the exact same ad agency that Apple use, has been using for years and years and years. Shy a day. You know, there's no exclusive contract. Go hire them. There you go. Um, and uh, uh, the, what makes Apple innovative is, is they know why they exist. That everybody who shows up there comes to work with a higher sense of purpose and a noble cause something to pioneer. Now, with their success and the loss of jobs, you know, the cracks are starting to show, and this is what leadership is. Leadership is nothing more than a compass. The responsibility of the leader is not, you cannot lead a company. You can only lead people. You can manage a company, right? 
And so the responsibility of a leader is to do one thing and one thing only, point way up into the distant future in the place we're trying to get to, you know, that, uh, and, and allow others, empower others to figure out how to get there. Um, and the more you empower others uh, to get there, the more that they will be uh, uh, inspired to want to help you get there because you've given them the opportunity to feel like their contribution matters. And at the end of the day, that's all any of us want. We want to feel that our ideas and, the, and our hard work actually does something and is cared for. And there's two components to that. You can't just suddenly empower everybody. You know, you come in and anoint people like an emperor. I empower you. You know, you, you can't do that. You know, you, you, hire, you, you, you hire slowly. You've got to make sure you have the right people who believe what you believe, right? And then you spend the time to train them and train them and train them and make sure that they are competent in their abilities to contribute. Then you let them out, you let them loose, right? And so the responsibility of leadership is to train their people and empower them to solve the problem, give them points in the direction. So you have to train them how to how to how to uh, uh, how to uh, uh, chop down trees before you can say get to the other side of these woods. But the manner in which and the path they choose to get to the other side of the woods, let them choose their own path, and and you'll see uh, a level of inspiration and contribution uh, unforeseen before. Okay, another listener question: What are your three best practice recommendations for creating an innovative culture in a company? The answer is no. Uh, and the, the reason is, is I don't believe in best practices, right? Best practices, like if I tell you there's a brilliantly innovative company down the street and they have a ping pong table in every conference room, uh, if you go put ping pong tables in every conference room, it will not drive innovation. That's best practices, right? What I can, what I can give you are three uh, parameters in which uh, innovation happens. Um, um, but the best manner in which to do that will be relative to your own organization. So I won't tell you, you know, here's three things that you should go do. Here are three parameters, right? Number one, people have to have a clear sense of destination, right? They have to have a clear, uh, a clear sense of what is this all worth? What is the point of all this? And if we never make any of our numbers, if, if, if you're going to tell me that this is going to be hard work and I'm going to have to invest a lot of time and energy, sacrifice time with my family, for what end? So I can get a bonus, you know? No, there's got to be something bigger than that. You know, what, what is the world that you hope to build that we're contributing to? And that vision has to have nothing to do with your product or service, you know? Um, it has to have nothing to do with you. It has to be idealized. I have a dream that one day little black children and little white children will play in the, in the, play, in the playground together. That's what Martin Luther King told us, right? It's a vision of the world that he hoped he could help advance, and he empowered others to help advance that vision. So number one, there has to be a clear sense of destination. And by the way, a destination is not a BHAG. Right? A destination is the place at which once you get there, you stop. So if, if, you, if you have a BHAG and you achieve your BHAG, well, then you have to go out of business now and shut the doors because you're done. A destination is an idealized vision of the future. So far off, you'll never get there. Right? That's number one. People have to have that. Number two, they have to have confidence in themselves. We know from working with the United States Marine Corps that, that a, an individual Marine, a young recruit, will not help his fellow Marines until he believes in his own ability. Your employees must have confidence in themselves before they are willing to help others, right? And think about it. If you have, there's only a finite number of personalities and you can put together any team you want, here are your choices. Somebody who, who, who truly believes in their own ability but thinks they're better than somebody else, somebody who doesn't believe in their own ability, or somebody who truly believes in their own ability but doesn't, uh, but, uh, but doesn't think they're better than everybody else. You know, you want the guy who thinks that they're not better than everybody else but believes in themselves. You know, talk to any Marine, they know they're good, but they don't think that they're better than other Marines. And that's why they work well together. And so our responsibility is to spend time, like a parent, you know, helping people learn what they're good at, letting them fail, helping them up, giving them support, disciplining them when necessary, you know, and helping them learn confidence. Confidence is a muscle. You know, we, we, none of us is born confident. We learn it. You know, so it is our responsibility as, as, as leaders to help our employees learn confidence. That's essential for innovation. And then, so you're giving them a destination, they believe in themselves, and then put them in an environment in which they can work together to solve that problem and stay out of their way. Let them figure out the, the solutions to their own problems, and if they fail, help them up, right? In other words, let them feel supported. If you do those three things, in, in, and you can be as creative as you want in, in the manner in which you do those things, Sometimes it comes in training. Sometimes it comes in offsite. Lots and lots and lots and lots of little things. Experiment. You know, you have to be innovative in even how you create innovation, right? But those three parameters, a sense of, uh, of where we're going, a belief in myself, 
and, the, and, and, uh, and trust in the people that I work with that we can work together to solve any problem, I promise you innovation skyrockets. Okay, I like it. Confidence is a, is a muscle. So how did you come up with your start with why approach? Was there some sort of failure that preceded it? Uh, how did I come up with start with why and, you know, uh, was, there big, some, was there some big failure? Of course. You know, like any good idea, it was, um, it was a solution to a very personal problem. I had lost my passion for what I was doing. Um, you know, I had a little strategic marketing consultancy and I had great clients. The work we did was good. I knew what made us different and yet I didn't love it. I hated getting out of bed in the morning and any energy that I had was completely invested in pretending that I was happy and pretending that I was more successful than I was. And, uh, and when I discovered this thing called the golden circle, that, you know, these three levels, every single one of our careers, even uh, every single organization, um, always functions on these three levels, what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. I knew what I did and I knew how I did it, but I didn't know why. And people gave me stupid advice, like, you know, uh, do what you love. You know, the problem is I was doing the same thing. I didn't love it anymore, you know. Um, and so I realized if, if the secret was these three things that had to be in balance, I didn't know the answer to one of them, why I do what I do, and I became obsessed, obsessed with, uh, with why I did what I did, or why I do what I do. Uh, and, uh, and it worked, and I figured out a way to help others find theirs. And um, 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 I shared it with my friends. My friends and started making crazy life changes. They invited me to their homes to share it with their friends, and, and so it grew. It was organic. It was accidental. I didn't expect anything. There's not a single thing I'm doing now that was on any plan. Um, you know, opportunity exists off the plan. You know, uh, and so uh, I, I, yeah, I have no, I, I have no clue how I got here. <laughs> An honest answer. Okay, we're near the end. Um, we've not. What have we not talked about? What else do you want listeners to know that we maybe haven't touched on? Uh, well, I, just a reinforcement that, you know, when, when we go to work, we think we're in business to sell widget A or service B, uh, and we're not. You know, these are all incidents. Uh, uh, um, you know, the reality is um, uh, uh, we're in business uh, for people. You know, we, we work with people, we sell to people. The people who use our products and services uh, are also people, you know, and the more you obsess about the human being, um, the better you will do in, in the structure that is called a business. That's all a business is. It's just a, a legal structure, nothing else. What makes a country a country are not the borders with, that contain it. What makes a country a country are the values it holds dear and, uh, 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 and, uh, and the beliefs it holds. Same is true for an organization. Uh, obsess about your people. Help them grow. Obsess about helping them build strong character and build confidence, and, and the business takes care of itself. All right, one last question. What's the right balance between process and innovation? Uh, what's the balance between innovation and, and process? Um, um, obsess about process, not about innovation. Innovation is a result. You know, innovation is, pro it, uh, innovation is like profit. It comes at the end. But process, the journey, the manner in which we conduct ourselves, you know, if you obsess about the journey and not the destination, uh, and not the and not the result, I mean, uh, if you're obsessed about you know how you're going to get somewhere and the, and, and the means in which you have to you have to tackle problems, uh, whether you achieve the you know financial results or not, uh, that's actually what works. If you obsess about innovation, the stress is too high. Uh, if you if you obsess about getting better at what you're doing, innovation will follow. Fabulous. Thanks, Simon, for an informative and thought-provoking presentation. I expect that many folks will be reorganizing their companies into three-person teams to increase creativity. That was an interesting stat. Hey, Vistage members, be sure to register for our 2013 Member and Chair Think Big Conference, where Simon Sinek will talk about why you should start with why. We're going to be in Dallas, Texas together, January 23rd through 26th, so... Register and join a lot of great CEOs and chairs and key executives down there. Also, please join us again next time for our Fridays with Vistage webinar. You can always register at vistage.com forward slash webinars. On behalf of Vistage and Simon Sinek, I'm Dave Nelson. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend.